you would this morning turn back in your Bibles, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and our reading this morning with verse 14, and down through the end of the chapter there, 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. Paul, addressing Timothy here, says this, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the Spirit seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. So these verses end chapter 3. As I've said before, the chapter divisions, of course, are not inspired. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's an error and it's profitable. I believe it's God breathed, but the division of the chapters is not inspired. But Paul ends this particular chapter as we know it with some instruction here to Timothy. And in this verse, Paul gives an insight into the purpose and the reason for this letter, for writing 1 Timothy. Paul, as we know, after his release from his first Roman imprisonment. We find that we talk about over in Acts chapter 28, verse 30, where he was under basically an imprisonment or house arrest for two years. He went and he visited, or we could say revisited, several of the churches which he had helped to establish and to minister in and to preach and teach to in the early days. Probably most of those in the area of Asia Minor. We would Call it. Uh, you can get one of your older, look one of your little maps in the back of the Bible. It would indicate which is the area of Asia Minor. But that included Ephesus. And when he visited there, he left Timothy in Ephesus, as we well know that this is where Timothy was when Paul wrote this letter. And so Paul had gone to Macedonia, and he was delayed there, and it necessitated that Paul had the right to address issues which needed to be addressed in the early church. We have to remember this is still a fledgling church. The church is still really, I would say, pretty much in its infancy, or what we might say in its adolescence. But he addresses these issues. And we've already covered these, but just to kind of give a summary of what Paul has addressed already, why he's writing these things, as he says. And Chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, Paul addressed the issue of false doctrine and sound doctrine. In chapter 1, verses 12 through 17, he gives somewhat of a personal testimony of his own salvation as an example of God's great grace and mercy towards sinners. The verse I, I really love in that particular first chapter there is verse 15, where he says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance or acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, whom I am chief. And he gives this testimony, I think, as a way of illustrating that salvation is not beyond the scope of anyone. It's all of God's grace. It's all of God's mercy. That there is not any sinner that is outside of God's grace, outside of the gospel. Chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, he ends that particular chapter. He gives that, but I would call a solemn charge to Timothy regarding his call to the gospel and the ministry, reminding him that it is a warfare. It is a spiritual warfare that he is in. As we have emphasized before, that for particularly for all of us as believers, there is a spiritual warfare that is going on. That, but for, for pastors and elders, they were on the front lines of this. And Timothy certainly was going to be on the front of the lines. And Paul said, wage the good warfare. Be faithful. 
In chapter 2, verses 1 and 8, he gives some guidelines for prayer, uh, specifically and especially regarding those in authority. He talks there about praying for kings and all those that are in authority. In verses 9 through 15 of chapter 2, he begins to address or he addresses the roles of women and men in the church and in society. What is the role of the man in the home and in the church? What is the role of the woman in the home and in the church and in society? And he goes from that then to giving in chapter 3 the qualifications of elders and deacons, which we have just finished. There are qualifications. There are many qualifications. It's not just one or two or three. It's, it's many. So he gives these. And so he does this, I think, to make sure that the purpose of the church, the purpose in the church, is to establish that it was to be grounded in both what we would call doctrine and practice. Now, very often, I mean, what we need to see in this, I think we have seen, we'll see like throughout this, we see in Paul's writings, is that there is a doctrinal basis for practice. You don't divorce one from the other. Your practice is not going to be above your doctrine. And so I think that's where many churches have gone astray in this day and time regarding sanctification and Christian growth and, and faithfulness is because there's really no, there's no doctrine taught. Or there's wrong doctrine taught. So Paul could not be there. He was still in Macedonia. So he entrusted this instruction to the young preacher Timothy. And he felt like this instruction could not wait until his personal return. I mean, this was not like, as you remember, it's not like an hour a day, uh, like that you could travel thousands of miles in a matter of hours on a jet plane. Uh, it wasn't like that. Uh, it involved getting on a ship or walking for many hundreds of miles. It may be some months. It may be some even years, so to speak, before he could get there. And so he felt like that this needed to be known now. And so he had these letters delivered there to Timothy. And so he writes here, so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. Now, when you first look at this on the surface, what people, many people might think is that he's talking about here how we conduct ourselves when we come to church. That's what people would probably think. This is what this is talking about. When we come to the building of the church, we all gather together, this is what it's talking about, how do we conduct the worship service. That is not what it's talking about. Now certainly, we are to conduct ourselves rightly in the church. I don't believe that the church is a show, it's not a concert, it's not entertainment, it's for the equipping of the saints. He's not talking about that. He's not talking about what kind of music we ought to sing, or any particular form of liturgy. That's not what he's talking about. The word for conduct, conduct here has the meaning of remaining or living. And the tense of the verb that is here in the Greek has to do with a continuous or a repeated action. He's talking about that which is ongoing, consistent. He is speaking here of life within the spiritual body we know as the church. How do you conduct yourself as a believer in Christ as part of the body. I read that this morning in 1 Corinthians 12 for a purpose. We are here as members of the body this morning. As members of a local church. We'll get more into that later. There's the idea, I think, unfortunately, that many have that some do not believe how they live their lives matters in regards to the church or to the body in which they are a part of. In other words, say, well, it's none of your business. They would say, it's none of your business how I live my life outside of the church. It just matters when I come to church that I'm real nice to you. I conduct myself okay there, but it doesn't really matter otherwise. That is not at all right. That is not at all right. Nothing I think, could be further from the truth in Paul's mind. The idea 
in 1 Corinthians 12, when I read that, is there are some that say, well, you know, I'm not a big part of the church. I'm not a teacher. I'm not uh, a deacon. I'm not, you know, I don't play music or anything like that. I'm not really, you know, an important part of the church. It doesn't really matter whether I'm vitally interested or how well I'm living my Christian life in regards to the church. It doesn't really affect anything. As you can see from 1 Corinthians 12 that we read, that's not true at all. That is not right at all. And in other places, if you go back farther in 1 Corinthians, in there in chapter 3, and right off the bat, of course, we know that the church of Corinth was, I mean, it was really... Terrible. Let's just be honest. But what was going on there? The immorality that was going on there. And drunkenness was going on during the Lord's Supper and division. And people saying, Well, I like this preacher, I like Paul, and others says, Well, I like Apollos, and others says I like Peter, and there was all sorts of divisions among them. In verses 16 and 17 of chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? The Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. The temple of God is holy, which temple you are. We're going to get into that about the house of God. You're, you're the church, and you're doing all of these things as if it, you know, as it doesn't affect anybody. You're bringing disrepute upon the name of Christ. Go farther on down to chapter 5, and I'm not going to read all of that scenario, but I'm sure most of you are familiar with that scenario in chapter 5 where there was sexual immorality going on within the church and it was not repented of by the church, but it was being saved. <coughs> it's no big deal. In fact, he says you're boasting about it. Really. I don't know how they were boasting about it. I guess maybe they were saying, oh, we have, we have liberty and look how we're exercising our liberty. We're allowing this immorality to go on within the church and it's fine in Jim Danny. Paul say, he says, you need to judge this person. You need to pass judgment. First thing somebody will say, well, the Bible says, judge not, lest you be judged. I'm going to take the context of that. It is hypocritical judgment. That's what that's talking about. Go back and read that over in Matthew. You'll find out that's what it means. It doesn't mean we're not to judge at all. If you go over to 1 Peter chapter 4, where Peter's talking there in chapter 4, verse 17. What does Peter say? For the time has come for judgment, what? To begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? What happens to those who are judged and they don't repent? What is that a sign of? A repentant heart? sign of being unregenerate and of the judgment of God. One of the issues that we have in the church today is because judgment is not passed at the house of God. And then there, are, there are other things. There's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 where Paul the Corinthian church was abusing Christian liberty. We're not to abuse our liberty in Christ uh, for the sake of our own appetites. Uh, and we've already read uh, chapter 12, verse 12 through 14, where he talks there about that we are all members of one body. So what is, what is Paul saying here, how you ought to conduct yourselves? He's saying it matters. It matters how you conduct yourself as part of the body. First, in relationship to our Lord and our ongoing sanctification, but it also matters in regards to the church body. It matters. It matters to those around me. The question we can ask is how is how I'm conducting my life edifying others? Okay. Ask yourself that. If well, how I'm living my life within the context of the church body, is it edifying? Is it encouraging? Is it lifting up? Is it giving a witness for Christ? If it's not, then you need to question that. You need to look at that. Is it furthering the ministry of the church? Is it furthering the gospel? And so Paul uses this phrase here 
and he speaks this, uh, where he speaks about how to conduct yourself in the house of God. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, the word actually is used to describe the believer's relationships with one another because the idea in the Greek is of a literal household. You could interpret that, that to conduct yourself in the household of God, in the family of God. What is he talking about? He's talking about a family. My family is here this morning. Now, my literal family, some of them are here this morning. I have others. But my spiritual family is here this morning. It's important how I conduct myself in the sphere of my spiritual family, in the household in which we live. We don't literally live with one another, but in a spiritual sense, we are living in the same house. I'm living in the same house spiritually uh, with Brother Elijah back there. Sister Felicia, all the rest of you that are believers here this morning that are part of this body, we're in the same household. It matters how I conduct myself in the household. Don't tell me if you're living, us usually the, the, the example of if you're living in a house, what's say? And you're not conducting yourself in your family as you ought to. You can't just say, well, this doesn't affect anybody else. You cannot say that. And the same holds true for the church family, for the church household, the spiritual family. The thing in Corinth affected the whole body. It was like a cancer. It was like a spiritual cancer. We talked about cancer this morning in prayer requests. It was like a spiritual cancer that needed to be cut out. It needed to be dealt with. You cannot leave it. And living, as he says, to conduct yourself in the house of God, in the household of God, you know, what do you have in a household? Number one, there better be love. There be love in the household. Number two, there should be encouragement in the household. Number three, there's protection in the household. Number four, there is instruction in the household. And there's also discipline in the household. What you have if you if you if you have a household where there's not discipline, you have an art. You see. This is why I say, as we're getting more into this, there is a dire need in this day for believers to be part of a local body. To be regular attenders and participants of a local body. If you are not, you are going to to suffer spiritually. Do not tell me that you can grow spiritually, that you can mature spiritually, that you can do okay spiritually without being a part of some local life and being ministered to by the Word of God and by those people that are with you. Look at Galatians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul over there in Galatians 6 and verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. We minister, and we are ministered to in the local body, in that family. In Ephesians chapter 2, there in verse 19, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You know, outside of this fellowship that we have here, how many of us would really have a lot to do with each other? Probably not many. We got some from Midway, we got some from 
Paul's Bowl. We got some from up around Winsboro. There you go. We got we got people from all over. Would we really have a close relationship with any of these people? And deep Barry, don't let me forget that that big city down there. Would we have would we have relationship and fellowship with these with each other? Not likely. But we're part of a body here in Long Beach, Texas. We have fellowship with one another. We benefit one another. We have a common bond. We are family members in Christ. We love one another. We're here. We we want this. And so Paul says here, he, he goes on to say that this conduct yourself in the household of God, what which is the church of the living God. The church of the living God. You see here the word for church is ecclesia. Probably heard that before. It means a called out assembly. It really it had didn't have really anything to do with what we think of as a church being honest about it, in the connotation that we use it in church. It really, in that day and time, in those cities, it, it meant a type of city council or a governmental assembly that was a, a called out assembly. And the first time we really see it is in Acts 2 and 47 where it says, and the Lord added to the church, we could say to the assembly, the called out assembly, daily those who were being saved. Now the word ecclesia is, is used both to speak of the church universally uh, over like in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 23 through 32 or where Paul gives the instructions, husbands love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. It is more the universal body there that he's talking about of, of believers that Christ laid himself down for. But also locally, like we talked about in Acts 2 and 47, he was talking about the assembly of the church there at Jerusalem. And Paul in his epistles will often make reference to uh, the church at Corinth and in Galatia and in Ephesus and in Philippi and Colossians. And the real honest, the real honest thing to look at is that the word is used mostly in regards to the local body. Many of the times I hear people talking about, well, I'm part of the universal church. They're trying to justify a lack of commitment to a local church. But we cannot deny the importance of the local church to the spiritual life of the believer. You cannot, as I've said, live the Christian life without the local church. You cannot just divorce yourself from the local church and then expect to grow and thrive as a Christian. As I've already said. I believe this, that the church universal is seen in the visible local bodies, the evidence of the visible local bodies. If you want to prove that you're a part of the universal church, then be a part of the local church. Where the Word of God is taught and where you are ministering to others they are ministering to and encouraging you. This is who Christ, the Savior and Lord of the church, this is who He laid Himself down for. As He, tell, as he, as he emphasizes back over there in Ephesus, this is the who He loves, this is who He nourishes, this is who He church. He, he, he takes care of this body. This is the body for whom He died. You want to thrive spiritually? grow spiritually? You want to find your ministry? People say, well, I can't find my purpose. Uh, I can't find you know, my ministry. I, there was a book, there's a thing, I hate to even almost bring it up, this uh, Purpose Driven Life thing came out years back. You want to find your purpose as a Christian? Take what you get in the church, local church, where the Word of God is believed, preached, taught, ministry to others is emphasized, the gospel is preached, missions is supported, there's people interacting with one another, you will find your purpose. The purpose for every believer, number one, is to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And then to get into the church 
in honor and serve one another. That's what Paul said in Philippians. To have that mindset that Christ had of being a bond slave. That's what we've been called to, basically, is to be slaves for Christ. So it is then and only then that we're going to be useful, that we're going to be equipped to be witnesses. About over in, again, this time in 1 Corinthians, and this time in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 20. Paul says, Therefore you are bought in Christ. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. That's not an independent thing. You're part of a body. You're part of a household. You've been called to glorify God. You've been bought with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Get some place and honor Him. And glorify Him in your life in your body and in your spirit. Don't be conformed to the world, to the mindset of the world which says, oh, I'm an independent agent. I can do whatever I want to. No. Paul said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is through the equipping again on the ministry of the Word in the church. You must have it. And then, the next point that he makes here, by the way, he says it's the church of the living God. <laughs> He's a living God. He's not a dead God. God is not dead. That movie came out years and few years back. Well, I already knew that. We know that by the moving of the Holy Spirit in our lives and His presence within us. We know that. But He is a living God. He's a God that moves and lives throughout our universe. He's in control. He's sovereign over all things. He's a living God. He's moving in His people. People have said before that, that you know, there's been here times when God was not present. He's always been present. He may have been, these people may have been worshiping in the caves, in the catacombs of Rome, in the wilderness, as the Waldensians. He's had a living church, and he's moved among them. You see that. But he says here, another point that he makes is that the church is the pillar ground of the truth. Some, I think, translations say buttress and ground of the truth. Uh, and you're going to think, why are you emphasizing church so much? Local church. It needs to be emphasized. The pillar and ground of the truth is the church and the ministries of local churches. It is not outside parachurch ministries and organizations. Okay? There's some fine ministries out there, Bible based ministries, that I am thankful for. Ligonier, Grace to You, Truth for Life, Way of the Master, there's some fine ministries out there. But the one organization that Christ died for is to be the pillar and ground of the truth is the church. They are the ones that are to preach the truth. And may I say that, I believe the biblical way to do that is through expository preaching. <laughs> I believe that's God's way. Uh, I'll run before I'll apologize for it. But you understand what I'm saying here. We need to recognize the authority of the church. As much as I appreciate the ministries of the men in these ministries, they're not the pastor of Faith Baptist Church. 
And also, if somebody visits my church and hears my preaching, they shouldn't go back to their church that's under the ministry. Let's say somebody like John Green over in Mount Pleasant is like, well, Brother Weber said this, and I'm going to take his word over yours. No, you need to go, they need to submit to the authority of that church and what he says. Now, hopefully, we agree, I think, on most everything. If we didn't, he wouldn't preach in my church <laughs> as often as he has. But you understand what I'm saying. And Paul, it's interesting, he makes this, this, and think about this in this context, he makes this application here that it is the pillar and the ground of the truth. And the idea probably is that this was written to the Ephesians. Guess what? Great structure from the seven wonders of the world is in Ephesus, the temple of Diana, the Ephesians. A magnificent structure. Now, it was, of course, pagan worship. But it had these great, I think there was 127 great marble pillars that <coughs> held up the roof of that structure. And it had a massive foundation. It had to. And those, those pillars and that foundation were what, up, what, what upheld the building. The church is called to uphold truth. The truth, the, the church is the foundation of truth because it is the we we, we base our world to preach and teach and believe on the apostles' doctrine and upon the teaching of Christ, who is the chief cornerstone of that foundation of the church. And let me say this: what the church teaches, the Christian church teaches, distinguishes it from all other religions. It's distinguished from that. You look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And there in verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians 3, <coughs> 9 through 11. Paul says there, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. In other words, he's talking about doctrine there, apostles' doctrine. And another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation is the doctrine of Christ, concerning Christ, First and foremost of all. Now we're not going to get to it today, but you look at that verse 16 there, and that's what Paul is saying, I think, here. Here's the foundation. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. <coughs> that's the foundation. And that's why we teach and preach the doctrine of Paul and of John and of Peter and of Christ from the Gospels because that is the foundation of the church. It is the pillar and ground of the truth. That doctrine. Now those in this day and time say we well, need to teach something different. You need to ease up on that apostle doctrine some. No. We need to double down on it. It's what we need to do in this day and time. It is truth. It is God's truth. It is the foundation upon which the church stands or falls. And if the church or a church forsakes the apostles' doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, guess what will happen? be as in Revelation when those letters were written to those seven churches and they taught false doctrine. Guess what Christ said He would do? I'm going to come and take your land stand. In other words, I'm going to come and take your authority. We need to stand firm as a church in the Apostles' doctrine and the doctrine of Christ because the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. May that always be the emphasis. The 
emphasis of the church should never be about, let me say this, should never be about music. I hear this all the time. Well, you know, I just don't like the music of that church. They don't have a singles ministry. They don't have an old folks ministry. I can say that because I would probably consider an old folk in this day and time. They don't have a children's ministry. Ministry of the church is the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. We're the pillar and the ground of the truth. And I think that the church, by and large, in the local assemblies, have lost sight of that. They've lost sight of that. This is to be the centrality of what we do. This is it. All 66 books of it. From the front to the back. I heard somebody say one time, he said, I think even my maps are inspired. I don't think so. But, it's for our instruction. It's our foundation. And seriously, we need to preach it because the souls and the lives, the eternal futures of men depend upon us being true to this book. To recognize that the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. And believers need to be a part of that. They should be a part of it. Maybe not. <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, we love the church. You died for the church. You sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to shed His blood body to be broken for the church because you love the church. Heavenly Father, I pray today that our faith has been strengthened through this word. I pray that we will not be discouraged by what we see in this day and time, but we'll recognize the holy calling that you have given us as a church body preach your truth and to be that pillar of the ground of the truth. We thank you, Father, for those that are here today. I pray, Lord, that your word has fallen upon receptive minds and hearts. I pray that soil has been prepared by your Holy Spirit that souls may be saved in the preaching and the teaching of your word today. In your holy name we pray these things.